and it's their intrinsic nature. You know, this food basically drives sound. Everybody, thanks for watching. Now, I put out videos before on hip hop and the music industry. You know, a lot of people wanted to know more about that subject and wanted more videos about this subject. Now, the whole thing is, I love hip hop. I grew up on hip hop. As I said, I was in the music industry. I own my own recording studio. I work with major labels. I work with a lot of artists. Now, I got out of the music industry because I could see what it really was and where it was headed. And my purpose was to bring conscious hip hop music, you know, conscious music to the music industry. But I could see what I didn't know at that time, but later on I could see that that's not what the music industry was about. That's not where it was headed and that it was controlled and everything that goes on in that industry is controlled, you know, to a certain point when you reach a certain point. So, you know, I got out of the industry and, um, you know, I started my own company, started my own business. And, you know, it's worked out for me, you know, becoming successful without hip hop. But the thing is, you know, I believe hip hop can actually save the black community. Right now, it's destroying the black community. It's giving us, you know, bullshit. It's giving us music not to stimulate us, but to basically dumb us down. And to basically, you know, keep our minds off of things that actually matter by making us worry about stuff that we're never going to touch, we're never going to see, and doesn't, you know, quite frankly matter. Now, there are some positive hip-hop artists out there. You're only going to find them underground. You're not going to find these guys mainstream. My goal was to bring these guys, you know, up, to put them in the right position to get this, you know, conscious hip-hop out there, this conscious music out there. But you know, the major record labels are not going to let artists put out what they want, especially conscious music that's going to uplift and educate the black community. Now, let's be honest. Let's keep it real. Now, a lot of people enjoy, you know, gangster rap or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And personally, you know, when you upset, when you mad about something and you put on that right hip hop track, for some people, it, you know, it calms you down. But for, you know, most people, it fuels that anger. Like if you get upset and you put on like, you know, that right record, you know, you put on like Tupac Hellraiser, that joint might, it's going to make you even madder. It's going it's going to fuel that anger. It might cause you to do something that, you know, you don't want to do. And, you know, that's the purpose of this music, to fuel angry black people, to add on to the violence in the black community. Now, like I said, not all artists has music of this nature. Most of them do if they in mainstream, but there are some songs that even mainstream artists put out that's positive. But when you really analyze some of these songs, they're not as positive as you think. You can't one minute promote peace, you know, and treat women good and then next minute promote violence and treat women like shit and talk about women, you know, in a derogatory manner. So this is, this is the trickery of hip hop and the industry, how they can play off, you know, things. They can deceive you and make you think an artist is okay and cool, but on the next minute, you know, you find that, you know, they contradict themselves. This is one of the issues that a lot of people have with artists like Tupac, you know, he put out a song called, you know, uh, Keep Your Head Up, talking to the women, but then he put out another song that's, you know, denigrating the women. This is the industry. This is how they play, but really it's to trick you and to fool you into thinking that these artists are just, you know, it's just music. It's nothing to it. It's just music. And I think... As we go along in this video, you're going to see that it's a lot deeper than, you know, just being music. Now, as I like to do when I talk about hip hop, is go back to the beginning. I do that because a lot of people don't realize how the start of hip hop is really pivotal. I mean, it's it's so pivotal and a lot of people don't see that it was a chance for us to really grasp something great. I'm talking about a really great weapon. And you want to understand, you know, in this video, why hip hop is the way that it is and why it had to be, why they had to make hip hop what it is today when you understand, you know, everything behind it. But I like to go back because you got to really look at, you know, how it began and everything around it. Now, I got into this before, you know, in the previous video. But the thing is, you know, when you go back and you look at 
the type of music that black people had out, you know, back you know in the seventies. When you look at the you know the jazz and the blues, you know, soul music, R and B, you know, before hip hop, look at the kind of music, you know, the kind of lyrics, look at the content that African American artists was putting out. So when you look at songs like, you know, Al Green, Let's Stay Together, you know, Temptations, Just My Imagination, Close the Door, Teddy Pendergraft, uh, Michael Jackson, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, Stevie Wonder, Living for the City. When you look at songs like this and you look at those songs, now all these songs is top 10, top 100, you know, greatest songs of the 70s, uh, these songs I just named. But when you look at these songs and you look at the content of these songs, I mean, we was uplifting each other. We dominated music for decades. Domination, complete domination by African Americans in the music industry. We had, although it was segregation in the, you know, the uh, 50s and 60s, when you look at the majority of the music, I mean, everybody was listening to black artists. We dominated music for decades. We were singing about uplifting each other. We was respecting black women. You couldn't turn on the radio, you couldn't listen to a song that wasn't begging a black woman for love or begging her to come back. You know, but all that changed with hip hop, of course. So when you look at these songs from the 70s, when you look at the content and what African-Americans was talking about, it makes you really wonder why would you put out gangster rap? Like, why put that out? You know, why would they think that, you know, people would accept this kind of music? coming from the black community, why would they believe that African Americans would accept this kind of music coming from the black community? And you know, when you, when you start to look at the interviews of people from back then, a lot of people when they're talking about, especially cops and especially lawyers and you know, people in the uh, legal department or the police department, they will tell you that this music is going to drive up violence. They was talking about how it's disrespecting women. I mean, they talked about every kind of negative thing that people didn't want to admit about you know hip hop music, about gangster rap. And um, it makes you think, why would they bring this music out? So you gotta understand they really had to get black people, African Americans to accept hip hop, to accept gangster rap. A lot of people think that we was just with it when it came out. But you know, when NWA released their album, Straight Outta Compton, there was a lot of black lash from the black community about that music, about those songs. But they had to sell it, not only to you know the mainstream media, but to African Americans, and I'm gonna get into that. But you gotta understand that these labels was already poised. It was already in position to take gangster rap, to take it over, because we didn't have any major labels. We wasn't set up to take hip hop where we wanted it to go, which is why you know it went where it went because we didn't know the business. We didn't own these labels like they did. They were already in position to take hip hop. And we couldn't keep it, you know, even if we wanted it, especially if we wanted it to go mainstream because they own mainstream. And that's what a lot of people got to realize. A lot of people want to say that hip hop is ours, but hip hop was only ours in creation. Hip hop is not even that really. And we came out with rap and we was rapping, we put the music out, but as far as where it went after that, that has nothing to do with us. We wrote the music, we sang the music, but as far as how it went mainstream, as far as how it was controlled and what it is today, you may think we had our hands in that, but that's not the case. And you can see clearly that it's not today. Back then, they had no clue. But now, when you start to look at the direction hip-hop has gone, you can see that there's no way any real conscious black person or anybody who's trying to really uplift and help the black community what put this kind of music out. So by that definition, by that fact, you have to say, you have to look at the music and say, who are these people putting out this music and why is it only this kind of content coming from black people? So now one of the things I want you to understand in this video is the culture that hip hop created, you know, where hip hop went. You know, when it started back then, the culture that it created, the atmosphere that it created, this is something that you're really gonna get you know, before this video is over. But, you know, most of you know, you see it, you live it every day. The black community is the hip hop culture. It is the hip hop atmosphere, everything that goes on there, whether you accept it or not, whether you understand it, it's based off of this hip hop culture, plain and simple. Because when you look at the black neighborhood versus 1950s, 60s, you know, uh, today, 
is completely different. Black people are completely different. We think totally different from what we did back then. The unity aspect is almost gone. I see it in some neighborhoods start to come back, but it's just we become so fake because of this hip hop culture that you can't hardly tell if a person is doing something out of kindness or if they're doing something, you know, to get a like or to get, you know, some kind of publicity or props. You can't really tell because the culture has made the community so, so weird, so different, you know, and it's, it's basically because of this music, because of the culture, because of the fakeness that it creates and the desire for people to get fame out of it so they will do whatever it takes to get a like or to get people to recognize them or notice them. Now, I grew up in all this shit, all of this drug stuff around all that crap. And I remember people, I had people on my block, I had a friend of mine, might as well say, that... um had good parents. Mom and dad worked jobs. They made a good living. I remember Christmases, they got everything for Christmas. They got good stuff all the time. We barely got anything, but they got whatever new game or new system came out. They lived good. They had a really nice home, but they wanted to be cool. They wanted to be thugs and sell drugs. And that's something I couldn't fathom. Here I am living in an abandoned house, struggling, mom in and out our life and they have everything but they want to stand on the corner and sell drugs and like their life today is done you got a couple of them hooked on drugs some of them are in prison but this is because of this lifestyle i remember how much they was into hip-hop and into the music they wanted to rap they wanted to be a part of that life because they seen that that's what attracted people that's what attracted the women i mean if you were do who going to school who working at the local supermarket. I mean, you were square back then. I mean, it's probably the same way today, but I remember when I was coming up, you was a square, nobody paid you no attention. You was that boy that went to school. But if you hustled on the corner and sold drugs, you was a ghetto superstar. You probably had a car, which that's probably all you needed back then to get girls. The girls was all over you. And even though the guy who basically bust his ass and went to school, probably left the community, did something great with his life, he never got that recognition or that attention from the community as doing something positive, as being the one who is going to school, who is working, who is going to be something later on. All that attention, all that positivity went to the drug dealer. Now, that's how I was when I grew up. I think people today are more willing to congratulate those who are doing something positive in the black community. You know, with all of the police brutality and police killings, more people are more willing to congratulate any black person doing anything positive in the black community. But, you know, the problem with that is it's basically, you know, too late. The damage is already done. The black communities are mostly destroyed. And I think what you're gonna realize by the end of this video is the only way to really repair the black community to repair, to repair black people is to change hip hop. That's the only way. We are driven by hip hop. And you gotta realize that everything that we do, the culture, the atmosphere is driven by hip hop. And they control it. And you know they don't want us to get anywhere. So you gotta do the simple math. We don't control what's driving the black community. They do. If we don't change it, nothing is gonna change in the black community. And it's, is really just that simple and you really have to look at the community and um and basically see how messed up it is how things are and really ask yourself how did it get so bad and i think that when you examine what happened and what took place you're going to trace it back to drugs hip-hop music and that's that's a fact now most people who make it out of the hood you see, you know, the success. You can see the difference in the mentality because people like us, we say, when we talk about where we grew up at, when we talk about the hood, where we come from, we don't glorify it. We, we talk about it as if, yeah, it was messed up. You know, it was bad. You know, versus people who are still in the hood who, who be like, yeah, I live on such and such block. We do this, we do that. It's people doing this. Not simply, you know, giving an analysis or, you know, really talking about where they come from, but kind of glorifying that they are from a block or from a neighborhood that's bad, 
that sells drugs, that people are getting killed, and that they want some kind of recognition for living in this fucked up neighborhood. And it's the same for people who come out of there. You want to be like, yeah, I grew up in this, in this hood. It was dangerous. People was getting killed left and right, but I got out of it. Versus people who say, it's this way, but I'm still here. Because the question you were asked, any sane person will look at them and say, well, damn, why are you still living there? You need to get up out of there if all this stuff you're talking about is going on. The thing is, if the black community was so great, if it was so good and people was having so much fun, how come when people get money, when they get some kind of success, they move out? If it was so great and so good and everybody was basically doing good in the hood and they had it popping and this and that, when they get money, how come they leave and they don't come back to the black community to give you anything to help you out? You know, all these hip hop artists who glorify the black community, they don't come back in and give you a thing. Some artists do, but it's mostly a publicity stunt and they don't do anything major to really affect the community as a whole. And you would think with all these artists making, you know, billions of dollars, they would have the black community would be in much better shape today. But these are the same people who are destroying the community that the people in the community is looking up to, you know, and that's the issue. Now, I have people call me a sellout, people who I grew up with. Oh, you sold out, you this and that. And people who don't know me, a lot of people think because I speak well or because I seem educated, which I am, you know, I came from some kind of good home. You know, I grew, grew up with a silver spoon and all that kind of stuff. And that's not the case. I grew up really, really rough, really hard. And I seen enough to where I knew something was up. And it actually made me question, you know, being black or what it meant to be African-American. I seen that something was wrong. And, you know, I grew up with a crackhead mom. You know, my mom was strung out on crack. She was really, really addicted. I watched her struggle through it with five kids, five kids. I'm a twin. I have a twin, a twin sister. And she's the, our only sister. I watched my mom struggle to raise us and struggle with her addiction to the point where she just left us. And when she left, we was alone. And when you leave kids alone, they're not going to go to school. I mean, if you're a kid and you're young, you hate school and your mom gone, you got no authority figure around to help you out, to, you know, to tell you to go to school and to tell you to do the right things. You know, it's a wonder that we are still here. You know, my brothers, I got a brother that's doing life in prison. I got, you know, my brothers are doing OK. My sister was doing good. You know, my mom was out there. She she went through a lot and I watched her go through it. And that made me who I am today. You know, today she's doing fine. She's doing well. She's good. She's no longer uh, doing drugs or anything like that. She's been clean for years. And it took something crazy happening to her for that to come about. You know, she had she got HIV and it took her getting HIV for her to really realize that she need to put her life back in order. Because before drugs, my mom went to college. She had degrees out the ass. Her room, I remember going into her bedroom, how she had awards, you know, all over the wall. And that's something that I ascribe to later you know, to try to mimic that, to be like how my mom was and be successful and go to school and learn a lot because that's where I get it from. I get it from her. But she got introduced to the wrong people and became addicted to crack. And it basically destroyed her life and really, you know, started to destroy ours. But, you know, I didn't come from, you know, a rich family or nothing like that. I came from that. I grew up in an abandoned home moving from place to place, trying to survive, struggling, sold drugs, did all the stuff that I talk about, but I didn't know. But what I did know was something was up and I used to sit back. And when you look at TV, TV, is it helps you out sometimes. <laughs> when you look at certain TV shows, I used to wonder why we didn't have any shows, why all these white shows and it seemed like white families was okay and sane when I step out my door into the black community I see what I see I see us in poverty it seems like nobody cares but you know at the end of the day and on the tv show for the white families like the Brady Bunch and all these other shows all the problems got resolved you know all the issues got fixed and it seemed like okay the national attention is on the white community you know, when you look at TV, it's always about the white community and white people doing good. And it's like, what is wrong with black people? You know, what is up with us? Whenever I see anything about us, we slaves. 
you know, so that really sparked something in my head. And this is this was around the time when I was basically dealing with uh, Christianity and what's up, God? What's, what's up with the black community? Why you ain't, ain't helping us out? You know, so I dealt with that struggle. I grew up through a lot of that and it made me who I am today. So by no means was I ever, you know, rich when I was young or lived a good life when I was young or anything like that. I went to the Navy because that was the only choice I had. I was poor. I didn't have anything. It was like I needed to do something. My best friend got killed by a smoker. So I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to go. But me, I know personally firsthand that everybody in there, we all live a hip hop lifestyle. We live hip hop culture. Everything was about the music. Everything was about doing what the music was talking about. And that's what everybody did. That's the way it was. And you can see it all over the place. Yeah. Sometimes it was fun. Some days was great. We had some good times. But when you step back and look at it, it was like, what the hell was we doing? We were stupid people who had no clue that we was destroying our own neighborhood. So yeah, one of my main goals of this video is to get you to understand the culture that hip hop has created. But the second and main thing is you need to understand how when we could not control hip hop, how we gave up the greatest weapon that we could ever have. Hip hop could have been the greatest weapon for African Americans in America throughout the world. Actually, when you look at hip hop and how everybody around the world is affected by the culture, affected by hip hop, you see people everywhere living a hip hop lifestyle, dressing hip hop dressing like the black community, dressing like us. Everybody mimics and copies what we do. You need to understand that. That's because of hip hop. That's because of the culture that it created. If we could have controlled that and made it positive, made it a part of the message that we really wanted to give up, to get out, it could have been the biggest weapon that we could have ever had, which is why they had to control it as soon as they knew what it was, as soon as they knew how popular it, it became. They had to control it. Now, all the only thing they did was they turned the weapon against us. They turned the weapon on us instead of us using it to really convey what we wanted to say about the black community. Now, y'all can sit up there and say, we was just telling how it is, how it was in the black community, you know, what it was like, what was going on, but that's not how you tell a story. You don't glorify the things that's destroying the community. And that's what that's what's going on with hip hop music. But it would have been the great still is still could be. But people are scared and they like money and they're scared to die. It, it could save the black community still to this day if we can get the right music out there. Everybody who has tried has failed. Everybody who has tried to start a label has failed. They control it. So what we need to do and what we must do is change it. And the only way we can change it is to stop listening to the artists who are who is destroying it. And that's the problem. People are not willing to step back and say, how can this artist talk about this stuff? How come these artists are not helping us? How come these artists are basically talking about destroying the black community? And if you be real with yourself and stop, stop trying to be cool and accept what they say, I was something that Tupac said. He said, listen to the music. And hold us accountable. Listen to what we're saying. Don't just bob your head to the beat. Y'all remember that interview. I think about everybody has seen that Tupac interview, heard what he was saying. He was telling you to listen to what we're saying. Hold us accountable. Don't just bob your head to the beat. Listen to what I'm saying. and Hold us accountable. Because he was trying to tell you. He knew this music is destroying the community. This music is not good for the black community. This music is harmful, but it's nothing that he can do because he signed that contract. The labels control his music, control his image and what he wanted to put out. Tupac was a rebel and everybody know that. And I always promote Tupac because like I said, I, he's somebody who I watch teeter, you know, back and forth. Sometimes he was, he had to do what he had to do for the industry. And sometimes he put out that positive music and I'm, I was a big fan and I listened to the music and I'm like, yo, this dude, you know, is telling the truth. Nas was another artist who was really talking, trying to talk to the people and tell you things. But you can see how it changed. All those artists who was trying to put out any kind of positivity in hip hop, any kind of music to make you think, they either changed their tune or they was killed or they're not in the industry no more. 
you know, it's something that you really got to look at and say, you know, what's going on? You know, but we we couldn't fathom that back then. We looked at the music and we didn't we couldn't see that this was the case and this was you know what the music was going to really be about. We didn't know. To us, it was just music. We didn't really look at it and say, you know, how come this white man, these people who lock me up, throw me in jail, you know, can't afford a lawyer, they give me this piece of crap public defender. These people who do all this stuff, who spend billions of dollars on, you know, a criminal justice system, on uh, jails and prisons to put me in prison when I do these things that I'm glorifying in hip hop music. How come these same people want to spend money to help me talk about this same stuff that they are locking me up for? We never fathomed that. We never thought about like, what's going on? What's up with that? How come I can do this? Because before hip hop, you can't just go jump on TV and jump on the radio and say, yeah, shoot a nigga, kill him. I'm going to sell drugs and hustle. You know, they'll throw you in jail. They'll look at you like you crazy. And that was the case. We have to look at that and say, well, wait a minute. How come people didn't realize what this was and that this was an attack on the African-American community and not something that was for us, not something that was by us. It was something that was created to destroy the community and they used us to do it. They took the greatest weapon we could have ever had and turned it against us. Had we been able to control hip hop, to really use it as a weapon for the black community, to tell our story, to say that, you know, it's drugs here destroying the community. It's, you know, cops come here and they, they brutalize us and they treat us, they mistreat us, they treat us like shit, they treat us bad. You know, it's things going on in the black community that y'all should know. And we put the music out there in a way telling the true story instead of glorifying the story that would have been a major weapon. And the thing is, we look at hip hop, we look at the lyrics, we look at the music, and a lot of people, you know, they get upset with the artists. A lot of people get mad at the artists. They say, you know, why you put this kind of song out? You know, why this artist is so negative? People don't look to the label, the people who are actually responsible for putting the music out and putting it on the radio. Don't nobody look at these people and say anything. You know, the news cameras came straight to NWA and said, you know, what's up with the content? Why are you trying to put this music out? Not fathoming, and the people not fathoming, they can't con control what goes out to mainstream. They don't run mainstream. You got white people running mainstream. They are not the ones who are putting the music out. I can write a thousand songs today and record them. I can't put it out to the masses. I don't have that power. We never had that power. They had that power. So nobody went to the labels or went to these radio stations and the people who own these stations and who, who really controls what you hear, what goes out to mainstream. Nobody went to them and said, what's up? So everybody going to the artist and complaining about the music and the content of the music and nobody is looking to the label. And that's because you see the news media, the newspapers was coming at the artists and not coming at the labels. They was creating the perception that it was the artist responsible for putting the music out. And it's one of the things that the mainstream media is good at is creating perceptions to get people to perceive what they want them to perceive to make you think we control something that we do not, but common sense should tell you we don't control the FCC. We don't control, you know, these broadcasting companies and these major labels and these major TV stations. So these are the ones we don't run MTV. These are the people who are putting this stuff out. We didn't run VH1 and we don't run all this, all these music labels and these uh, radio stations who are putting out this kind of music. We didn't own the shops that was printing the CDs and distributing them them to the stores. We didn't own the stores who was putting it out. So all this stuff goes back to people. That's not us. It goes back to white people. It goes back to these Jews and these people who control this whole entire industry. So anybody who had a problem with any of the content from hip hop should have looked to them first. But since, and it's something that we didn't figure out or we didn't look to, the very same people who control the label, it's the same people who control, who own the uh, news companies, the uh, newspapers. So you talk about companies like Tom Warner and Disney and all these news companies and these news corporations, Rupert Murdoch News Corporation. You're talking about 
These same people, these same companies own almost every major label out there. You got Universal, you got Comcast, you got Universal, the music group. It's the same. Universal owns a lot of news corporations. I put out before about the big six and how they own everything. So we didn't fathom that the same people who's coming to us saying, what's up with the music, black people this, why y'all putting out that? It's the same people that own the labels and this whole thing is a big trap. It's a big trap set up to bring down the black community. And I put out in the video the calculated destruction of the black man and woman about how music affects the brain, how tones affect the brain, you know, about tonal language. I talked about all this stuff. So what has happened to our young people is that this frontal lobe is your defense system. Music bypasses the frontal lobe. It enters. Your ears are way back here. Your frontal lobe is way up here. This is your temporal lobe. Music bypasses your frontal lobe, gets into your brain, so that when music is given to you, whatever message is tied to the music is not properly analyzed. Now, one of the things I want you to understand is that the, um, the ancient Egyptians and most of the Africans speak a tonal language. They speak in tones. Now, Vietnamese has 11 different vowel sounds and it has six different tones. Now, Cantonese has a complex six-tone system, and uh, Thai is even a, a very complex uh, tonal system, tonal language. You know, but English has no tones, no tones at all. Now, as a matter of fact, the Rothman Research Institute in Toronto, they was actually studying, you know, tonal language. And they realized that people who speak tonal language actually can uh, really decipher music better than other people. They have a, a real uh, rhythm. They can really, their brain is already set to the rhythm of music. So it's real easy for them to play instruments or sing and, you know, things of that nature. So the neuroscientists at the Rothman Institute, they basically said that if you speak a tonal language, it improves how your brain hears music. It improves how your brain hears tones. And they came to the conclusion that music is a language. Now, before you speak, a stimulation occurs in the brain and then the words, you know, flow out. Now, people who speak in tones, when they speak, the tone of that language comes back to the brain through the ears and it actually stimulates the brain. So the implications are people who speak a tonal language over time actually improve a higher brain development. So basically more parts of the brain become developed and they become smarter. Now, let's just think about a dog who doesn't speak English. Let's think about tones here. Think about visualization. So a dog, what happens? You tell a dog to speak. After he speaks, you give him a treat. Now, the dog is going to take the representation of that treat. Whenever they see it, Whatever tone comes out of your mouth, their brain is going to hear that tone and obey that command in order to get that treat. So if the tone is to speak, he's going to bark. He hear that tone. That's what he understands. He understands the tone. Dog don't understand English. It's the tone he understands. So he's going to do whatever that tone tells him in order to get that treat. Now, I want you to think of the implications of what I just said and apply it to hip hop music. Apply it to music. Apply it to hip hop music videos. See, we have to understand positive and negative tones. One tone is going to be positive. It's going to help your brain function. It's going to make you smarter. Another kind of tone is going to destroy your brain. It's going to make you lose control. It won't stimulate the brain at all. It's going to take control of the brain and force you to act out and do what that tone is telling you to do. So, black people. We always wonder why, why white people send their kids to music schools and why they make them play an instrument like the violin or the piano when they're growing up. You know, what was that whole thing about? Why do rich white people get all dressed up, all fancy just to go hear somebody play Mozart or Beethoven? See, we didn't understand. We didn't get what was the whole fuss with Bach and Beethoven and Mozart? What was the whole fuss with classical music? It was just a bunch of guys playing piano or playing a you know, violin. You know, what was the whole thing with that? But what they was doing, these geniuses actually played certain music, certain songs at certain tones that would stimulate a higher brain function, that would actually help your brain develop and make you smarter. This is what these guys did. 
So you have Mozart, who has the Sonata for two pianos. Played at D major, this song actually stimulates the brain. This song actually, it's been documented as helping stop seizures in patients who have epilepsy. It's amazing, you can Google it yourself. So these people knew how powerful this music was and that it actually stimulated the brain. Beethoven, Beethoven symphonies five and six improves brain activity when played at certain frequencies. And that's another thing about all this music. They, they figured out if you play this at different frequencies, because I said before, everything operates on frequencies, then it, it, it has different ways of affecting the brain. So basically like at um, 18 Hertz, improves memory, language, and uh, processing power of the brain. So you can actually do math a lot better while listening to this music at 18 Hertz. So when you think about all that, you see why classical music is associated with wealth, with refinement, with intelligence. It's associated with a higher level of people, a wealthier people. So when you think about classical music in that aspect, you see why the relationship with people who are wealthy and successful goes hand in hand with the music. So look at hip hop music. What does hip hop music associate with? Well, you already know the answer to that. So hip hop music is associated with a bunch of bullshit, a bunch of mess. And we think that's us. We think that's what we are about. Oh, this our music, this black music. That's what we about. We about gang banging, shaking ass, and shooting niggas in the head. But they listen to Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, and they about wealth. So the music they listen to is reflecting their reality. Wealth. This is why they're becoming geniuses. You got these Albert Einsteins, and you know, look at Steve Jobs, people like him, and look at people like Bill Gates who are intelligent. You know, this is what their music is doing to them. And, this, and look at what our music is doing to us. So you understand what I'm talking about. And we think it's ours. This is why they let us keep hip hop. As I said earlier, we got to figure out why they take away all the good stuff. And we really got to pay attention to what they let us keep. This is why they let you keep hip hop. Because they know what it's doing to your brain. But I know y'all. I know my people. I know how y'all act. I know what y'all going to say. Man, I ain't giving up my hip hop, man. You crazy. You tripping. But you got to understand, you don't you don't really have to give up your music. You need to be conscious of how the music is affecting your brain. That's all. Just be conscious of it and understand what it's doing to you. Now, if you have everything you need in life, if you are where you want to be at in life, you obviously can't blame this music. You're, you're doing well. The music is not influencing you. But if you are not where you want to be at in life, if you're having troubles and if you're dealing with certain people who listen to certain music, I mean, at some point, you got to put this together and understand it's the music. It's affecting you. you. don't see it or you don't want to admit it, but it is. Look at what these people are accomplishing listening to this classical music. This is why they tell you let your babies listen to the music while they're in the womb. So they develop a higher brain function early. This is what they're doing to their, to their children. We let our children come out and we, we got them shaking their ass already at an early age. It's not funny, but we got them listening to, you know, all kinds of stuff. Nicki Minaj and Jay-Z when they little. How do you think that's affecting their brain? I mean, come on. We got to understand, guess, guess where they got this knowledge from? Guess where Bach and Beethoven, guess where they got this information from? From you. From your ancestors. From black people. That's where they got it from. They got it from us. And, and look what they give us. So we're going to take this classical, nice music, and we're going to develop ourselves. Y'all can go ahead and have y'all hip-hop and see what happens to y'all. As I said, if we control hip-hop, if we made it something positive, made it something that would stimulate our brain to do something positive, to be great, to be successful, you know, to be positive, then, you know, it would, been, it would have been the greatest weapon that we would have possessed and it would have definitely changed the way the black community is today. But instead, they took control of that weapon. They took it from us and turned it against us. And we have what we have. As I said, tones is everything. When you get people who say it's just music, they don't understand tones. They don't understand why a commercial is 30 seconds or 15 seconds. They don't understand why when you walk into supermarkets, they play certain music or certain songs. People don't understand how music affects the brain. They do. I also showed in the video about how the Grammy Foundation basically donates millions of dollars to researchers like the Rotman Institute 
that's in Canada on, you know, they donate money to get the information that they have about how music affects the brain and what music, what tones can stimulate the brain to do certain things. And you have to understand music is the only thing that can bypass, you know, your frontal lobe far as the, the barriers that your brain creates to protect itself. Music can bypass all that and make you do things that consciously you don't know you're doing, nor do you want to do. Now, rich people or people who grew up with some kind of wealth don't have that kind of uh, stimulation that needs to be filled like people in poverty. As I was pointing out, you got to understand that this music creates the stimulation to try to get you to fulfill it, but to do negative things to fulfill it. So you're basically working against yourself. So think about it. If you have a stimulation that's telling you, I want to be rich, I want to have girls, I want to have nice cars, I want to buy you know, mansions and yachts. And the relation to these things is selling drugs and shooting guns and treating women like bitches and hoes. That's what you're going to mimic. And that's what's going on. You are mimicking these things instead of mimicking something positive. Now, if the stimulation for wanting money, wanting nice cars and mansions and girls had to deal with going to college, had to deal with starting your own business or being some kind of you know, economy genius to help your economy grow and be better in the black community, then that's what we would be. We would be trying to go to college and to you know, better the economy and fix the black community instead of destroying it. So when you understand how these tones work and how the stimulation work, you can see that if you are poor, it's easy for you to be susceptible to this stimulation because you can't feel it being poor. If you are born rich, you don't have it. It can't affect you because these things you already can buy, you can get. So the stimulation for these things is not there. It's already been filled by your money, by your wealth and what you have. So they must keep the black community in poverty in order for this deception to work. And that's what you need to understand. Nothing is going to change unless the music can ch uh, changes, unless the message change, unless we associate the stimulation for want to be successful, want to have nice cars and be rich, unless we associate it with something positive, something better than shoot a nigga in the head, you a bitch, you a hoe, then that's all we're going to get. And the black community is going to be what it is today still. It's going to stay the way that it is. We got to be real with ourselves and look at this stuff and say it's destroying us. So some people may think I'm just tripping. You know, it's not that serious. All you have to do is look at the culture. Look at what's going on around you. Anybody being real with themselves right now know what I'm saying is true. Look around you. Look at what's going on. Look at how we had so many black people killed by cops. You would think that would have brought us closer together. But you still have black on black crime. You still have us calling our women bitches hoes and derogatory names. You still have the attack on the black community. We didn't come together. We should have really united based off of these things and say, you know what? Something is not right because they let these cops kill us. And then we complain and we march about it and say black lives matter. And we still listen to this music that that's promoting violence and exactly what we are marching about. So you got to understand that they understand this. You got to understand that this is the problem. This is the issue. It's not about tripping about something. It's about the facts that it's not good for us. This music is bringing us down. And unless it changes, we won't change. Things is going to stay the same. But now you got to look at the attacks. You got to look at the weapon of hip hop and how it was first used, how it was deployed on us. I mean, what is the agenda? First thing, as we know, Get the black man out the household, get him from out his house, get him away from his woman, get him to disrespect his woman, get him away from his kids and then attack the kids to get them to turn on the women. Because if a kid don't respect his mom, he definitely not going to respect his girlfriend or, you know, the rest of the women walking up and down the street for that matter. And this is the attack that, you know, hip hop had. He had these black men saying, you know what, I'm going to go chase this stimulation. I'm going to go chase this dream of being this hip hop star. I'm going to say, forget school. I'm going to you know, quit my job. I'm going to devote everything into this music industry and 
you know, black women ain't gonna stand for that. So you, one, already from that aspect, you creating a separation because you have a family to take care of and you need to do that. You need to take care of yourself better instead of just putting everything into, you know, hip hop. And there's a lot of artists out there who, who are doing that, who think that their dream is gonna come true because they got skills. And I'm telling you from a person who's been in the industry, that's not the case. There's a lot more to it than that. So you have these black men out here chasing this dream, you know, and Dawn, you know, fulfilling that stimulation. Since I want these things, I got to do these things. I got to be the drug dealer. I got to be the robber. I got to be the killer, the murderer. I got to be the gangster. I got to follow what this music is telling me to do in order for me to get these things. And that's how we lost a lot of black people. We lost people who inside was feeling like, you know what, I'm chasing my dream. This is my dream. And when you're chasing a dream and you feel like you're doing what you need to do to fulfill a dream, it's not too many things that a person can say to get you to turn away from that. People are not trying to hear all that positive talk or any kind of talk that's going against their dream. It's just like with religion. You know, people don't want to hear that stuff. It's something that they believe is going to fulfill their dream, so they're going to stick with it. But people thinking they're going to become some kind of ghetto superstar, but not just that. People who were just, you know, me, I wasn't, I was into hip hop, but I wasn't like really like, you know, falling for it as much as I've seen other people do. I was just trying to feed myself and feed my brothers, you know, you know, put food on the table. So it was like, just like with other people, it's so much of a need to survive. So I got to sell these drugs. I got to do this stuff. I wasn't out there calling, you know, disrespecting women and stuff like that, but I did what I had to do to survive. And that's the case. You know, the question is, what do you do as a poor black person who don't want to commit crime? You don't want to sell drugs. You don't want to go rob nobody or do anything wrong. And you went out there and you tried to find help, but ain't nobody going to help you. You can go out there. If you're too young to sign up for food stamps, you don't want to go into foster care. You can't sit out there and panhandle for money and beg people for money every day. You might not get it. People might not give you stuff. And who wants to do that as a man? Beg somebody else for money. So you do what you have to do. And that's what's going on in the black community. And that's what we say. And that's what we use to justify our actions. We say we're doing what we got to do. That's one of the saddest parts about, you know, the black community is you actually got people who want to do positive things, but don't have any, you know, way of doing so that, you know, they want to change their life. They want to get out. They want to do something good. They want to be successful, but they can't. And you get trapped. You get stuck in your surroundings. And if you homeless or if you're starving or you're living in poverty and you got somebody who around you who got money who trying to give you some you know something to do to get you to make money and you know at that point you really don't care if it's crooked or you know as long as you ain't killing nobody really which it does lead to that but if you can stand on the corner and make some money to better yourself and not look like you know a bum begging you know it's tough for a poor black person to turn that down. It's tough. You got to do what you got to do. And that's, that's how a lot of people grew up with that mentality that you got to do what you got to do. So that was the first part of their plan to basically get African American men to fall victim to this whole culture, this hip hop culture, to want to be a rapper, to want to sell drugs and to want this kind of lifestyle that we fell victim to. Now, as I also pointed out in the previous video, I did on destruction of, uh, black men and women is about how that at the same time you had these, you know, record labels popping up with hip hop all over the place. You had these major corporations building these private prisons and hip hop helped them fill these prisons. A lot of people that is in jail, whether they realize it or not, are there, are there directly due to this hip hop culture and this lifestyle they live that told them in order to get this success, to get the fame that they want, they need to do these bad things. They need to talk about these bad things. They need to rob and steal and sell drugs. And it landed a lot of us in prison. And as I said, this is by design. You get the black man out the house. You get the children to disrespect their mom, to disrespect black women. And this just causes the next generation to spiral out of control because they have no respect for the women because their father is not in the household to tell them, you know, what's going on, what's up, how to be a man. And a lot of them didn't have their fathers and wasn't raised correctly to know, you know, how to be men. So we have a lot of people in the black community today who are 
basically, you know, raised by moms or grandmoms or aunts or what have you. And there's no real positive black role model in the household to tell these black children what they need to do, you know, what they need to watch out for and how they should be treating women, how they should be treating themselves. So this was one of the biggest blows to the black community and to uh, the African-American family. But now, of course, we have, you know, the second real uh, attack was to really destroy black women, to really destroy the image of black women, not just in the eyes of you know, black men, but in the eyes of the children and in their own eyes to, to show black women that it's a certain way they're supposed to act and be. And, you know, if you remember, see Dolores Tucker. A lot of y'all remember her. Tupac had a beef with her. See, Dolores Tucker was trying to really tell us these things. And we really didn't know back then that, you know, what she was saying had any validity to it. We thought she was just some old black woman, you know, old fashioned, who didn't get it, who didn't understand. And when you listen to what she was trying to tell us, I mean, it all relates today. And it's almost like, you know, a warning of the future or what it could be and what's going to happen if we didn't listen to that woman, which we did not. And we can see what happened today. But take a listen to what she was saying. Today, we have all come together to join forces to address the issue of violence in the nation, a violent which has decimated our communities, devastated our families, and destroyed the souls of so many of our youth. It is imperative that we stop the agendas that are not too relevant as this, that we stop pondering over the issue of space exploration, that we stop debating whose diary we should publicize, <laughs> that we stop arguing over what choices each lifestyle has. For today, we must be serious about this serious situation, this plague, this death to our society. Our greatest fear right here in America is not from hurricanes or earthquakes, not from disease or war, but from violence one against the other. We must understand clearly that violence comes in many forms and is acted upon by many sources. Whether we are talking about physical violence, spiritual violence, economic violence, or sexual violence, the end result is the same, the destruction of human life. Enough is enough. And I'd like someone to bring me what made me say enough is enough. Where's my graphic? Bring it up here, please, somebody. I am here to put the nation on notice that violence perpetuated against women through the music industry in the forms of gangster rap and misogynist lyrics will not be tolerated any longer. <laughs> Principal, principle must come before profit. A year ago, I established the National Political Congress of Black Women's Entertainment Commission headed by Dion Warwick, Melba Moore, Terry Rossi of Billboard Magazine, and Vaughn Alexander, our director. It had one primary goal, the task of examining and developing strategies and solutions for reshaping and maintaining positive images to preserve the dignity and the heritage of our youth. Instead of continuously exposing our youth to negative media that distorts their images of male-female relationships, that undermines the stability of our families, communities, and nation by encouraging violence, abuse, and sexism as acceptable behaviors, and perpetuates the cycle of low self-esteem of African-American youth. Thus, images that degrade our dignity and are an insult to our children, our families, and communities concern us too. And that includes all this gangster rap and misogynist lyrics, music that glorifies and promotes violence with guns, knives, or drugs, and denigrates and defames women. And with the release of Snoop Doggy Dogg's debut al album, Doggy Style, 
<laughs> that includes artwork that is nothing but pornographic smut available to any child to go in and buy with the album and with a record. That has got to stop. You want to know why I'm on the war path? When I saw this, I said, that's it. We march again. And we're going to keep on marching and demonstrating the truth. Stuff. For 400 years, profit came before principle as black women bore the brunt of slave masters' degradation. But even through the Middle Passage, the peculiar institution of slavery, the spirit of black women and their families could not be broken. Today, however, through the lyrics of rappers who display no respect for women, no respect for families, and little respect for themselves, the souls of our sisters are being destroyed, and so too their progeny. All of us have watched as the industry have grown. We have watched not really knowing, not really understanding, not first realizing the damage that is inherent in what some thought were merely words. Now we see the direct and indirect effects. We see the rise in murders, in abuse, in batterings, teen prostitution and teen suicide. We hear the wailing mothers, the grieving sisters, the tormented brothers and fathers and children planning their own funerals with pink dresses and pink caskets. We feel their hopelessness and helplessness and we embrace their pain. Yet in the midst of these tragedies, others still want to argue about the First <coughs> Amendment right to freedom of speech, a freedom they have embraced to call African-American women hoes and bitches and sluts and even worse. As I see it, these are, there are three things wrong with gangster rap and misogynist lyrics. It is obscene, it is obscene, it is obscene. <laughs> Obscenity has long been an exception to free speech. If the filth that is portrayed in these gangster rap videos and art is not obscene, then I submit that nothing is obscene. In 1992, the Canadian Supreme Court ruled that it was more important to ban speech that is dehumanizing to women than to protect free speech. African American women have always been the protector and nurturers of their homes, their families, and their communities. We march for our rights to Selma. I was there with Dr. King. We're beaten with billy cubs and we're bitten with dogs unleashed by bull Connors. We will not tolerate in injustice and insults from our worst enemies then, and we sure ain't gonna accept insults from our youth now. All right. Okay. Although, although the MPCBW condemns the actions of those young people who produce such music, we also realize that we must provide other channels for them to use these multiple talents they have in a positive and wholesome way. After all, after all, they are not the root causes of the complex socioeconomic forces that are manifested in such vile entertainment. Those problems were there long before many of them were born. Those problems must be addressed if the communities that produce those gangster rappers are to survive and thrive. <laughs> Provide community outreaches so that our youth who have embraced the gangs as their only family will find refuge in community institutions, neighborhood academies, and educational programs. Convert our unused military bases into institutions of peace where men and women can be trained to become productive citizens who will contribute to the well-being of this nation, expand our nation's infrastructure where needed, and make this nation a powerful global force. I stand before you today with millions of my sisters to say that no one has the right to degrade, denigrate, dishonor, or disrespect <coughs> African American women. No one has the right to poison our children's mind and destroy our African cultural heritage. That is why the women of NPCBW and our supporters will demonstrate, will go to jail again and again and again, just as we did when we demonstrated at the Wiz in December and Sam Goody yesterday. No one and no industry will be allowed to continue this social and psychological genocide of the women and girls of this nation. Stand before you today with the spirits of Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Fannie Lou Hamer, 
and Murray McLeod Bethune to say this, we will defy any force that will dis disrespect us and our families, and I apologize, Mary Berry, my good friend and family. <laughs> Now, when you look at that, you know, back then you would say, well, she just tripping. She don't know what she's talking about. It's just a, you know, an album cover. It's dogs on the cover. It's not real people. But she got it. She's seen that it was an attack. She's seen how it was sort of like, you know, hip hop was attacking black women. And she was standing up. It's the woman who marched with Dr. King, who really was for, you know, civil rights and for the black community and for the empowerment, the, you know, the the betterment of black women, to make us stand up and be proud of who we were, who we are or who you are, black women, to show you that, you know, you have a voice, you have a say-so on what takes place not only in your home, but in the black community, instead of just, you know, bowing down to the man or letting the man tell you what you are. Then, of course, when hip hop comes out and just really attacks black women so hard, it's like, you know, she stood up and said something about it, you know, she had her beef with Tupac and she was really against hip hop music because she understood, you know, it's a weapon, it's an attack against us. I think later on Tupac understood that and he got that, you know, maybe it's something to what this woman was saying. And, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why he started to change his whole outlook on things towards the end. And, you know, he wanted to start, a, you know, a black political party, a black, uh, like a tea party, but, you know, for black people somebody in Congress to actually talk about the needs of black people in the black community and to help us have a voice, you know, in Congress. And, you know, he was killed before he could do any of that. So when you look at this attack, to me, it's the, the worst one, you know, not just taking the black man out the house because the black woman is strong enough to raise as she has proven. She is strong enough in some cases to raise the black man, you know, it was tough for my mom because she was drug addicted. But when my mom got herself together, she she was a good mom. She still is a good mom. And she came out of it alone. You know, my dad wasn't around like that. But um, she did good after she got herself together. And I see a lot of uh, independent, a lot of, you know, single moms out there really raising good kids. Kevin Durant, I mean, prime example, single mom. Look at Kevin Durant. As a matter of fact, I think Lifetime made a, a movie about her life and how, you know, she raised him. But some people can do it. You know, some women can't. Some women are weak and they fall victim to this whole culture of hip hop and, you know, listening to the music and what the music is telling them they should do and how they should be and how men are stimulated by a certain type of woman. But that's a negative woman. That's not who they really want to be deep down but they feel like this is what they have to be. This is the way it is. And, you know, C. Dolores Tucker was really out there promoting women's lib and women's rights. And it's a shame that she died the way, you know, it happened about, you know, everybody really was coming at her and, you know, was negative against her as far as attacking hip hop because we didn't understand what it was. Now, one of the arguments I get from white people, I got into a little debate with one of my friends white guy about how NWA basically destroyed the black community, how NWA was responsible for, you know, bringing down the black community with hip hop. And as I was pointing out earlier about, you can't really blame them. You got to understand how that whole thing was a setup. Now, maybe they knew that it was a setup and it was a publicity stunt to really get black people to accept gangster rap. But, you know, when you see the interviews of Jerry Heller and, you know, Dr. Dre and them now talking about what happened back then. Jerry Heller's talking about how he went to Capitol Records and went to these other labels. And they basically was like, you can't put this stuff out. You know, then he went to Priority and Priority Records was, you know, accepted him and this and that. And how when N.W.A. shot the uh, video, you know, straight out of Compton, sent it to MTV. MTV was like, hell no, we're not playing this. Now, you got to remember, a lot of people don't realize that whole thing was a publicity stunt to get African-Americans to accept this gangster rap because contrary to what you may believe, I know it's hard to believe, you had people out there who was really against black people, who was totally against this gangster rap because they can see what it was. So they had to bring us in on it. Do you honestly think if N.W.A. would have just came this music, I mean, it just bam, it's on all the radios, 
on a TV, the video, and they're talking about murder, killer, drugs, this and that, black people would have stepped back and said, oh, you tripping. They're going to think that's all of us. They're going to think there's something wrong with us. You can't put this music out. We would have protested it, and we did protest it. This is what you don't see. We did protest this music. But when you have Jerry Heller, when you have the story of N.W.A. out there the way that it is, it changes the perception. So when you look back at it, you see that they're saying that the label said no. And then right after MTV said, no, we're not going to play your music video. How come it was on the news? How come that made headlines that MTV turned down gangster rap uh, group N.W.A.'s music video? Well, I'll put that out there. If they really didn't want people to know about gangster rap or hip hop, if they didn't want to spread it, you most certainly don't put it on national news. You don't put it on TV so people can look at it and say, well, how come they want these black people to pay, play their black music on MTV? What's up with that? We remember they didn't want to play Michael Jackson. So that's something to stimulate black people and say, okay, now I want to play another black group. What's up? What's wrong with their music? And get us to rally behind NWA. Then you look at all of the interviews that followed it. As I said, these are the same companies that own the labels. So you got to peep the trap. All these news companies down there interviewing NWA. And NWA on TV saying the right thing. They saying, oh, well, you know, we're just trying to talk about what really goes on. We're just trying to give people the truth about the black neighborhood. It's not gangster rap. It's not uh, promoting drugs. It's not promoting violence, which it was, of course, to keep it real. But it's just we're trying to get our voice out. We're trying to be heard. And what happens? You get black people saying, yeah, let the niggas be heard. They're trying to stop something that we're doing. See, they understand us. They got us figured out. They knew what would stimulate us, what would get us to rally behind gangster rap. And that's what it was. You had a bunch of people telling us that we can't do something as black people. So you have black people listening to this music. First of all, as I just told you, it bypasses all of the defenses of your brain. So automatically when you hear this music and you get this stimulation and then the beat is bumping, it sounds good, automatically you're going to like it. But when you examine the content, you can't in a conscious mind say that it's good. But that's what's happening and we're not understanding that. that in our conscious state, we're not seeing you know, what it is. You have to be strong and have some kind of control over your brain to really analyze this, you know, these lyrics, this content and say, hey, something is wrong with this. And it shouldn't be played. And we should have said that from the jump. But they got a sucker into the whole black versus white thing as they knew that would happen. And Jerry Heller was smart and doing it like this. They even came out and said, I think it was the president or CEO of Priority Records came out and said himself. The whole thing was a publicity stunt. He said it. I think in the, uh, the documentary that Chris Rock narrated, he says it in there. He says that it's a publicity stunt to basically... Bring hip hop in, and that's what it was. You wasn't going to get us to accept it, but telling us we can't have something make us want it even more, and that's what it was. That's an old trick. Tell somebody they can't have something, and then we automatically want it, and that's what happened. So you remember that you know that was like 1988 when it came out. 1989, you know MTV finally plays NWA, and we see them in your MTV raps, and they put out um, Express Yourself. And that's another video, another song that's deceptive, that gets you to think that, okay, well, they're just expressing themselves. What's wrong with expressing yourself? You know, First Amendment rights. We're just trying to express ourselves and tell our side of the story. Getting black people to accept this music that's destroying us, this gangster music. Getting us to accept that, you know, it's something that's black and it's us. And we're just trying to put our voice out there and be heard and uh, put our story out there and really... You know, it's a weapon that's destroying the black community. And they was really, really brilliant at implementing their plan. And we had no clue what they was trying to do. And we just went with the flow. And like I said, the stimulation that the music creates, a lot of people related to that, especially back then in the 80s when, you know, you could barely get a job. So a lot of people was like, okay, this is something for black people. This is something that we're going to rise and use to uh, rise up and really it was a trap, you know, the whole time. Now, if you remember the video, Express Yourself, how they showed the, uh, you know, the slave master on the horse on the plantation, you know, basically harassing the slaves. And then it shows, you know, that time when cops are on police horses, 
harassing black people in the black community. So I was kind of sh kind of trying to show this whole comparison between slavery and today and how nothing has changed. And that again was fueling people even more to say, you know what, this hip hop is real, it's telling the truth, it's, tell it's telling our story. And they got people, you know, for the first time on a huge scale because now you had this song on MTV and people was, black people was watching it all over America and everywhere else. And when they seen images like that, they got black people more on board with accepting this gangster rap. And not just that, it was something in us that wanted to say, okay, this is a shot back at you. You know, we're talking about the truth and we're telling the truth. And we thought that we was actually, you know, using this music as a weapon to tell our story, not realizing that, wait a minute, the platform in which we are using, we don't own, they own. So how can we, we be trying to tell the white man about their problems or what they're doing to us? And we're using their platform. We're using their tools. We're using their stuff to put out our message, not thinking that this could possibly be a trap. And a lot of people didn't realize that. A lot of people fell into the whole perception that Easy e you know, black people actually could put out this music when it really wasn't us. So when you listen to N.W.A., you listen to the music, from that time, it's almost like, you know, NWA foreshadow, like they predicted the LA riots, like they predicted, you know, they were saying that, you know, this stuff happens, police brutality, and they beat people, and this and that, this is what goes on, and then Rodney King gets beat. It's like they foreshadowed it, like they knew it was going to happen or something. So you have NWA talking about this, saying fuck the police, all this stuff, putting out uh, music videos and songs that talk about police brutality and this and that, Rodney King gets beaten. Now, it already was tension, you know, between the cops and black people just because of the way things was. It already was tension. You know, the music came out, created more tension. But then when these cops got acquitted, like we know what happened, it just drove black people over the edge. And then the riot started, you know, the whole LA riot. And a lot of people can't fathom that Maybe the um, Rodney King beating was a setup, that the whole thing was planned. If not the beating itself, then what took place after was planned. A lot of people can't fathom that until you really go back and you start to examine the whole thing. When you look at the story, you know, it's weird that his name is Rodney King. You know, last name King, something that black people can relate to that last name. You know, thinking about Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's something that black people could just, you know, it'll stimulate something in us to say, wait a minute, you know, what's going on? They beating up a man named, black man named King, and we tired of police, uh, police brutality. And then black people can say, see, we told you, you know, the music was, was talking about it. We told y'all this is how it is, you know, and then a riot started. And, you know, it's a, a lot of craziness that came from that that I'm going to get into a little bit later, because a lot of people don't think about how that really destroyed the image, destroyed our image and aided to, you know, this whole attack against the black community. But when you look at back then, you can see how the media, just like today, was instigating black versus white, talking about you no know, drug dealing. You know, it was like towards the end of, it was like Bush's last year, you know, the whole LA riots and the whole war on drugs thing was still going on. It was, you know, cops still were showing black people you know, in the hood and cops arresting them. And, you know, that whole TV show was also destroying our image. There was so much going on around that time that led up to, you know, the whole L.A. riots. And when you look at today and how all this stuff is going on with the shootings and killings of black people, you can't help to think that maybe they was trying to, you know, start something again with riots. And, you know, with Trayvon Martin, the whole verdict, it was like the O.J., not O.J., but the whole Rodney King case all over again when, you know, how could this do get off? You know, Jordan Zimmerman. And then how can all these cops who are killing people keep getting off and keep getting, you know, suspended with pay? And it was like they was trying to fuel us to do something, you know, like the whole, you know, L.A. riots. But, you know, we march and people, for the most part, peacefully protest until Ferguson got a little out of hand. But when you dig into that, you could see that that was a setup as well. This, like, really, it was something that Dick Gregory said that made me really look at this whole thing differently. Dick Gregory was talking about, he did an interview, and Dick Gregory pointed out the fact that 
about 18,000 people got arrested on the whole LA riots. 18,000 people, over 18,000 people. And then they can only account for 8,000 later on. Like over 10,000 people just disappeared. They couldn't account for them. They didn't know what happened to them. And it's something that he, he was saying, he pointed out that it was um, organ stealing, that the whole Rodney King thing and the whole race, the whole uh, riots was so they, they, they can arrest people and steal organs. Now, you have to think that, um, you know, 10,000 people missing, that's a lot of missing persons reports. That would be a lot of, you know, conscious black people out there in front of the news media, you know, at the police station saying, yo, we got all these black people who are missing people. Something is up. How could these cops, you know, take 10,000 people and, you know, nobody say nothing. So I don't think it was like a, you know, regular people. If it was people getting taken and having their organs stolen, it couldn't have been regular black people. But you have to also look at what else was going on around that time. Now, another thing that was going on around that time was the whole debate, the whole issue with Skid Row. Now, if anybody who knows about Skid Row, Skid Row, which a lot of cities unfortunately have a Skid Row. Skid Row is basically a part in you know, downtown Los Angeles where it's basically full of homeless people. It's full of you know, drug addicts and you know, uh, people with alcohol problems and you know, people with addictions, people who are homeless. Skid Row is full of these people. Now, they have been trying to get rid of these people for a long time. It was, you know, leading to a climax right, right before the L.A. riots. I mean, they had an issue to where they were trying to put toilets out there, like the portable toilets, and they didn't want to do that. Skid Row is something that is still to this day, you know, debated and, you know, people talk about it and they try to help these people in some ways. But you have to look at the whole thing. And this is something that. I seen when I was watching a documentary on Skid Row, they use the uh, riot to get rid of a bunch of those homeless people. Now, whether or not they was taking their organs, I don't know, but they got rid of a shitload of homeless people during that time. And if you ever look at the documentary on Skid Row, it's, it's a couple of them. Some of the uh, homeless people talked about how a lot of people disappeared you know, during the riots. And I took it as like, uh, I mean, after the riots or whatever, I took it as something like um, maybe they got their life together and, and left. But, you know, when I analyze it more, I see that, um, because this was a minute ago, I watched it. I see that, that maybe that's what happened. Possibly they came down there and they racked up a bunch of homeless people and did or took them who knows where. But the simple fact that they put on record that you had over 18,000 people get arrested. You know, so they had to have some record that it was that number. And then the next day, poof. So when you really pay attention to that whole riots, to everything that happened, you can see that it's like they knew. It's like they prepared for it. They knew this was going to happen. They knew it was going to be some kind of riots. And it's something that this news anchor uh, pointed out on the news. Take, take a listen. They obviously have thought about this, they anticipated this, they meaning the LAPD, they obviously have plans to deal with it, and uh, as we said before, they've allocated a million dollars to overtime in case things like this happen, so they are obviously carrying out a pre-thought-out uh, uh, plan. So now understand, after, you know, gangster rap, these riots, not to mention, as I said, you know, the TV show cops destroying our image with every single episode. After this, we basically gave, you know, white America, we gave the media the power to say anything about us. We gave them the power to change the way we was perceived and to, you know, have validity behind it. Now, instead of us, as I said, using hip hop as this platform to tell the truth, instead of us saying, you know, in our lyrics that, you know, this is what take place in the black community. We're not proud of it. You got people here living in poverty, doing what they got to do to survive. You got the cops coming in here, harassing us and, you know, police brutality left and right. You got women selling themselves for, uh, for, for drugs. You got women with children leaving their kids in the house, you know, for hours so they can go out and score some drugs. I mean, instead of us really painting the problem, we glorified it. You know, we didn't say that, you know, you got 
black people who are basically trapped in their own communities and they don't have the funding, they don't have the money to get out. They don't have a way out. And it's not like we can call the cops or you know uh, try to say anything to stop the violence or stop the drugs. Because if you call the cops to say something, you label it as a snitch and you probably end up getting killed for that. So you got people who scared to walk down their own block, who trapped in their own house, their own neighborhood. And this is the problem that the drugs, you know, and the violence and the gangs and everything was bringing to the community. Instead of us conveying this as a way of saying, help, y'all got to fix this. Something is wrong. These people need help. You can't keep locking these people up and there's no real rehabilitation. You know what I'm saying? There's no programs when they come out. They come out worse than when they went in. You go to prison with an addiction and you come out. I mean... You have nowhere to go. You have nothing to do. It's the same thing if you were selling drugs. I mean, you come out worse off than you went in if it's no program for you when you come out. If it's no real rehabilitation, you come out needing to do exactly what you did to get in to survive. And this is what's taking place. And this is how we should have conveyed it. Not only would it tell our story in truth, but it would get black people to look at everything totally different not glorify it as something that we enjoy. So we basically gave them the power to basically talk down to us, to talk down about us, to look at us completely different. You know, up until that point, a lot of people had no clue really what goes on in the black community. You know, cops basically showed you people who probably had mental illness or people who was, you know, drug addicted or had, you know, drug problems or drinking problems and the people who were selling drugs. We didn't really get into, you know, the rest of the community and, you know, what we was doing and, and did we really agree with all this stuff. Hip hop basically said that we did, you know, instead of us, you know, basically saying, this is wrong, us putting our head down in shame saying, yes, we don't agree with blacks killing blacks and, you know, uh, girls selling drugs and selling their body and leaving their kids in the house and, you know, uh, people getting robbed and having to worry about walking down the street in your own block and catching a bullet that's meant for somebody else. Instead of us holding our head down and said, you know, we are ashamed of this. This is not what we are. This is not what we are about. Instead of us doing this, we threw our hands in the air and all those people who hate this stuff and all those people who really don't want to live in the black community and be surrounded by this whole drug problem, they basically said a resounding we love it. This is who we are. We don't have an issue with it. This is what we said when we accepted this gangster rap. We made it cool. This stuff is cool. We okay with it. This is how we want to live. And that's the way they took it. And then you had them send the news cameras right into the neighborhoods, put all this stuff on TV, all over the news, how the black community is messed up, how we selling drugs to each other, how we destroying our kids' mind how we killing each other, how we doing the, un, you know, despicable things to each other. They came in and they pointed their cameras and said, see, I told you these niggers are the problem. These niggers are crazy. I told y'all, I told y'all you shouldn't have let them free. Made the KKK come out and say, see, even the KKK, if you remember, came out and was protesting music saying, I told y'all these niggers is crazy. So they all came out and then it's like, what can we say after that? After the riots, after the music and promoting it. They can say anything. And this is what basically created the whole stereotype, you know, about black people being lazy, us not wanting to do anything but sell drugs and destroy our community. This is what created that stereotype back then after these riots, after this music. And like I said, you got to realize that these white people listen to hip hop. They know what the music say. So when we out there marching, talk about some Black Lives Matter, they like, man, get that shit out of here, y'all bullshit. Because you can't believe that and then go and promote this music. They calling us on our shit, and we ain't realizing it because a lot of you think that it's just music. I mean, you gotta be real with yourselves. I mean, it's like a joke to them that we can be out there marching and talking about Black Lives Matter when we listen to songs that glorify killing black people. So it's okay when another black person kill a black person, but when a white cop do it, oh, it's an issue. White person do it, it's a problem. So how can black lives matter if that's the case? So we got to realize when this stuff happens, when we glorify the music, 
We are telling them that we are cool with it. We are okay with what goes on in the black community. And this is why nothing changes. So we live this whole hip hop lifestyle. We live in this hip hop culture. And we gotta understand how we promote, you know, gangster rap and the violence and everything. You gotta realize that they can see all this stuff. Just like how you go to your Facebook page and you can see all the little memes and videos that we share with, you know, girls twerking and all the hood fights. And I mean, all the DVDs that was put out on the hood fights and what goes on in the black community, they watch this stuff, they can see this stuff. So just like it comes down, you know, on our Facebook page, on their Facebook page, they see the same videos we are seeing. They know what we glorify. They know about worldstarhiphop.com and the kind of videos they put out. They seeing the same stuff. So as I said, how can we try to be taken seriously as a people when we joke about what's destroying us? We find entertainment in our own destruction. And that's something I always say, how lost we must be that we find entertainment in our own destruction. We glorify our own destruction. What other race does that? So yes, we may internally know what's going on. We may look at it and say, well, you don't understand the black community, or you don't live here, you don't know what's going on. But then we don't show them that it's something else. We show them that we are glorifying the problem. And that's the thing, They, you know, a white person don't know what goes on in the hood, so they can't look at it and, and see the issue. So. What are they seeing? They seeing World Star. They seeing hood fights. They seeing what you put on Facebook timeline. So this is their whole image that they are getting of the black community and it's creating this stereotype and it's creating this separation and it's giving people a valid argument against us. So I've argued with a lot of white people, as I said in the last video, their arguments are the same. They all come at the black community, they come at how we glorify our destruction and we sit back and just say well you don't understand but in reality they are right and that's something we got to realize that nothing is going to change until the culture change and what's controlling the culture is hip-hop so unless you are willing to change it or to do away with it nothing is going to change and that's something you got to understand it's not going to get fixed I don't care how much we march how much you pray how much you, you want to move out? Because that's what everybody's saying. I want to move out the hood. I got to move. In the meantime, you're there. So you got to change it. It's not going to happen until the music change, until the culture change. And then once that change, then, you know, will change. So as I said, for the people who don't believe, you know, that hip hop has shaped our culture, is driving our culture. You just got to look at the culture itself. Look at the people. I mean, when we started out, we started out already on the wrong foot. I mean, using negative words to, you know, uh, basically put towards positive things, you know, like saying something is stupid or dope, you know, why would you want to call something good stupid? Why would you want to call something good dope? You know what I'm saying? So we started out like that. And then, you know, look how it progressed to us calling each other niggas. Nigga, 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 nigga. You know, we flipped it and said, oh, no, that's not what nigga mean. We're not saying nigger, we're saying nigga. But, you know, in their mind, they don't care. You're calling each other nigger, that's exactly what they wanted. And, and if you don't think it's really affecting us or causing the culture to be what it is, I mean, just look at Mexicans. Look at Puerto Ricans. They say it. They grew up in our culture as well. They say nigga, nigga. They live in the hip hop culture like we do. Everybody does when you really pay attention. Look at the car commercials. You know what I'm saying? Pay attention to a lot of these commercials have hip hop things. A lot of the TV shows that you watch wouldn't be what they are without hip hop culture. You got white people using our words, getting laughs out of it because of our culture. So when you look at, you know, Puerto Ricans calling each other niggas, hey, my nigga, my nigga. Mexicans calling each other niggas, what's up, nigga? You got what I'm saying? You see how it changed? Even white boys say it who want to be down, calling each other niggas because of the culture. Back then, 80s, 90s, you couldn't call a black woman a bitch. It's a fight. That's a big argument. I mean, today you get some sisters who will get at you. You call them bitch. But for the most part, they call each other bitches back and forth. That's my bitch. Yeah, bitch. What's up, bitch? And you know, you probably want to know people who do it. But to you, it's not nothing. It's not a problem. It's how I relate to my friend. But to them, it's, it's success. It's their goal. It's their agenda fulfilled. What they wanted to happen. What Miss C. Dolores Tucker was trying to keep from happening has happened. She didn't want y'all calling each other 
derogatory names. And she tried to warn us about it, but you know, we didn't listen. So now you gotta pay attention to hip hop today and see how it's been flipped and understand what has taken place. Because a, y'all, a lot of y'all are not gonna realize what's going on or see what is taking place because it's taking place slowly. Look at how white people are infiltrating the whole hip hop culture and sort of taking it over. I mean, I can't turn on, you know, I can't go log into Facebook or look at Facebook without seeing these uh, groups. How many white hip hop dance groups have you seen? How many white groups, dance groups have you seen dancing to Beyonce and dancing to hip hop music? They out there killing it to hip hop music and making money doing it. I mean, they got crazy dance routines that you see from these, you know, white dance groups, dancing hip hop. You see them in a regular day, you would never know they know anything about hip hop, but they taking over slowly. You got artists like Macklemore coming into the game, white dude, getting Grammys. You got white people getting signed into hip hop as, you know, white artists, taking away record deals from black people. You know, it's the same thing on the R&B and soul side, you know, the pop side. We rule pop music. We rule R&B, but you got these white artists coming in, slowly taking over. So now they can come in to the music industry and put out their hip hop content and put out their stuff and say it's hip hop, say it's rap. But it's going to be looked at totally different from when we do it. When they do it, they're going to look at it as, oh, this is good hip hop. This is okay hip hop, what hip hop should be. But if we do it, they're going to say, oh, this is gangster rap. This is negative music. Look at the, just the content of the music today. I mean, you got one, another thing, you got white girls twerking, making money off of twerking, putting out, you know, how to twerk videos, you know, all these, twer- all these twerk things that's coming up that I keep seeing with white people doing it, you know, twerk aerobics, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff that they making money off from hip hop. But when a black girl do it, it's looked down at like she's a whore because you got black girls who go set the camera up and twerk, and put it on Facebook just for a like. For a damn comment, making no money at all. But then you got these white girls, some Latino girls too, who making money, twerking. So they stealing our culture. They're stealing it, turning it into what we should have made it in the first place and making money from it. And then they're slowly pushing us out, slowly pushing us out. Look at all these white artists coming in. Look at all these white dancers coming in, taking over, slowly turning our stuff into theirs. So these corporations and companies, these record labels already making way more money off of hip hop and the culture than we are. It is making them more wealthy while destroying our our culture, but not only that, our community is destroying everything. And they are poised right now to take over hip hop completely as far as who the front men are, who the main people are, and they putting out all these artists that's basically taken away from you know hip hop being created by African Americans. So as I said, they're gonna make everything that we do derogatory and everything that they do positive and good. It's gonna win Grammys, it's gonna win awards. And we get this dumbed down, watered down hip hop. I mean, you hair artists, I mean Nas, Tupac, Lauren Hill, you know, people who was talking about stuff, who was saying positive things and stimulating your mind and making you think. You know, even Rock Him, you had certain artists who did say stuff. Even though they was gangster rappers, they at certain times would say good stuff. These artists are gone. They ain't not out like out there no more. You know, you got some people who can put stuff together, but as I said, not big time major artists. And you know, now we got artists like, you know, we go from Tupac and Nas and people like Lauren Hill, which is why Lauren Hill it's not in the game no more because she's tired of this crap they're trying to make her put out when she want to stimulate your mind. You know, people like Erica Badu also want to stimulate your mind, but they forced to put out this Illuminati crap or this whole, you know, this deceptive music, deceptive images. You know, we had that good music coming from Tupac, coming from Lauryn Hill, coming from Nas. Now we got, you know, Fetty Wap, Trap Queen. You know, I'm in love with the Coco. You've got videos showing us doing exactly what they think we do, cutting up coke on the table, 
You know what I'm saying? Disrespecting our women. Everybody is in on it. The mom in on it. And then you got white people who look at this like, how the hell can they have these music videos where the mom is there? You know what I'm saying? Growing ups around. Black grown folks is in on this whole, you cool with this dude cutting up coke in your house? You know what I'm saying? You okay with what's going on? So they look at us totally different. This is adding on to the stereotype. And you get these arguments. I was just in the argument. If you go to my video called the, um, what is it called? The Ignorance of the Black Muslim. I want you to read the one comment that this white guy left. I responded to it. Somebody else responded to it. It should be in the newest comments. This is recent. Just go read what he said. You know, I, w- I would put it up here. I probably still do. But read what he said, because you probably won't be able to read it on this screen. And I want to read all of it. Just go read it for yourself, that, because this is what they think about us. Now, he was saying something to the effect of how, you know, Negro communities is about violence. Every race is scared to go into the black community and this and that. He was saying some stuff that I, ha- I said nothing about. You know, about Jesus being black and all this and that. Some of the stuff he put in there, I have no clue what he was saying. He's just, to me, a racist person ranting due to his ignorance. But um, this is what they think about us. And it's because of what they see on TV. They have this whole perception of black people. And it's sad because, you know, it's no excuse today. Back then, they may have got us because we didn't know what, what was going on. But today, it's too much information out. And too many people can see you know, what's going on. You know, all the black artists who come out to try to tell us the truth disappear. Prince is gone now. Prince dead, gone. Michael Jackson, gone. Tupac, gone. So, you know, we can see people like Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, who are trying to put out the truth, they, they disappear. So as I said, when you are real with yourself, no matter how much you enjoy hip hop music, because as I said, I'm, I'm gonna keep it real, I love hip hop music. Even the music that's gangster music that I'm talking about, it sounds good. I mean, I don't need the stimulation to fulfill some of these things they talk about. I'm successful. You know, I'm okay. So I would, I would never follow this stuff. I'm a lyricist. I like lyrics and words. Like I like people to say stuff to stimulate my mind and make me think. So I would never listen to some of this music that's out now. I don't even know what's really out, you know, except for when I'm driving down the street and I hear people banging something. I'm like, what the hell is that? You get what I'm saying? I'm like, what the, you know, what's going on with the music? You know, and I get a lot of, you know, people who I knew in the industry used to contact me for talent. You know, I was sort of like an A&R. I found talent. I put talent out there. I put together their press kits. I put together their whole, you know, everything that the A&R would need to shop to the label. And I shop artists around. That was my thing. But, you know, I first started out with uh, gangster rappers and then moved to conscious rappers. But like I said, when you, you get to a certain point where you realize that one, and this is for anybody who wants to be a rapper, if that's what you're thinking, I'm gonna tell you now, excuse me. If you think that you're just going because of your talent, walk into the game, it's not gonna happen. You need money. It's gonna take a lot of money. One of the things I've seen and dealt with when I was in the music industry is people who just don't want to invest the money in themselves. It's going to take a lot of money. And a lot of people don't have this money. The labels want you to already look like you signed and famous before you even get signed and famous. They're not just going to even sign, they're not going to sign you because you sound good. I mean, Soldier Boy should have proved that to you because he's garbage. His music is garbage. A lot of these cats who come out is garbage. That shit tell you there's more to it than your talent. You have to have the money, one, that they had the connections, two, it's people who got the money but not the connections. People got the connections and not the money. You get to a point where people want money, it's going to cost money to get this stuff on the radio, it's going to cost money for the promotion, it's going to cost money to shoot the right video, to get the right camera and equipment, to shoot a professional video. As I said, you know, people put out mixtapes, they put out songs and music for a fan base of 20. 30. For what? Why would you waste your time putting together a CD to hand it out for free? That's another thing that's stupid. Sell it because a person would respect it more. And I'm talking to people who, you know, who are conscious rappers, not anybody who out here spreading this garbage that's destroying the community. A conscious rapper, you better off going uh, indie, independent, by yourself. You can get a label deal if you want and get raped or get a distribution deal and put your music out. 
Look at the boy Hobson, who is killing. He got a lot of positive songs he put out that's good. But, you know, a cat's not going to really touch him. I don't know who he's really working with, but the boy got skills. He is one of the nicest rappers out right now who's putting out, you know, good positive music. And we need more artists like that to put music out coming at these frauds. One of the things that Dick Gregory was talking about, how he don't hang out with any celebrities because they all frauds and basketball stars and stuff like that. All for, He called them all frauds. A lot of these people don't realize how they're being used to destroy us, their own people. And then the ones who do still don't care because they're getting money. They're getting paid. They sold you out. Some don't realize it. Most of them do. And that's what you got to understand. If you want to be an artist and in this industry, you are basically saying, I want to sell you out. Because if you think you're going to come in and do your thing and it's going to be cool. I'm seeing black uh, artists want to be famous so much. They throwing up the, you know, the horns and they, they doing a six, six, six and all that. They do all this stuff. Because they want to be down. They think this is going to get them the attention to get into the game. So they're saying, basically, I'm willing to sell my soul to get a record deal. That's how desperate some of these cats is. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what's going on and how stuff works. There's a lot more to it than what you think it is. And it's one of the reasons why I didn't want to deal with it no more. So what I want you to take away from this video, it's not, I know it's not that long. As I said, I did a video called The Calculated Destruction of the Black Man and Woman. I go into music a little more in that, plus other stuff you need to see. So you can watch that or watch just the excerpt I have on the trap of hip-hop uh, music and movies. Another video I have on my channel you can check out that I went into a little bit more in those videos. But what I wanted you to, to come away with in this video is that you know hip-hop is a weapon that has been deployed against us years ago it has destroyed the black community and it has made us think that we are something that we are not we are not this culture it's not our culture it's not something you should be proud of it's something that you should be trying to escape from and become success successful now when i talk to certain people some people i mention my own personal story like i told you you know, earlier about my mom and everything like that. I'm not ashamed to talk about that because my mom came out of her situation and, you know, we we're all doing good now. But, you know, it's something that I wanted to share with people so you can see that you, even though you may live in poverty, you may not have much. It's possible. If, like I said, if I can come from where I came from to where I am today, anybody can do it. Anybody can be successful. Anybody can have their own company, you know, work from home, do whatever they want to do. You know, go to college, you know, be working towards a Ph.D., you know, have multiple degrees, a law degree, you know, all the stuff that I've done. I've done because of what I went through, you know, my upbringing. And I lived in that culture. I glorified that culture along with everybody else because I didn't know, you know, what it was doing. You know, but once I got the education, once I got the knowledge and I seen it, I didn't just, you know, turn my back on it and pretend that, you know, what's going on is not going on. I stopped listening to the music. I literally stopped. You know, the hip hop music that I do listen to is like old school. I listen to some Pac. I ain't gonna hold you. I listen to a couple of Biggie songs. I listen to, I love Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill is one of my favorite artists of all time. She brilliant. Listen to Lauren Hill. You know, mostly classical music that I listen to. I listen to, you know, classical music is good. I know a lot of people go say, oh, it's boring. It's gonna put me to sleep. Well, good if it do. Because it's gonna stimulate your mind while you sleep. Listen to it. And, and then after you finish listening to it, read a book and understand how you're going to go right through that book fast because your, your brain is going to be stimulated. The music really works. Studies, as I showed in the video, has been done on Beethoven's music, uh, music and how it stimulates the brain. Somebody told you to let your baby listen to classical music in the womb, you know, put the headphones over your stomach, stimulate their brain. This stuff works. You know, but I grew up listening to old school music, listening to jazz Listening to Al Green and, you know, Teddy Pendergrass and Michael Jackson, and Stevie Wonder, you know, The Temptations. I grew up listening to all that music. So I still listen to that stuff today. I still listen to that same music. It's good music. You know, the content is good. It's something that you can sit back to and groove on it. You know, Bob Marley, Jimi Hendrix was amazing. I mean, this is the stuff I listen to. And, you know, to each his own. As I said in the video, I can't make you stop listening to hip-hop music. I can't say don't listen to it. You're going to listen to it regardless. 
But if you have the knowledge and understanding of what it's doing, not just to, to you, but to the community, then, you know, act accordingly. You know, don't let it make a decision for you because you're trying to live, you know, some hip hop lifestyle. You're trying to, you know, mimic the music or you're trying to be cool. Just be real with yourself. Like, don't let this stuff destroy you because there's a lot of people. Remember, as I said before, remember Dave Chappelle when keeping it real goes wrong. I mean, there's so many people that has happened to trying to keep it real, trying to live the culture, trying to impress people and it turn on you. Some people lose their life. Some people end up in prison. And for what? At the end of the day, when you're sitting in there, you look back at what got you here. It's stupid. You stepped on my shoe. You know, I actually, another personal thing I'll talk about, I actually got in trouble. I got arrested. Coming out of a club, this was years ago when I was in the Navy, stepped on some guy's shoe and said sorry, brushed it off and everything. And this dude still wanted to fight me because I stepped on his shoe because he was in front of two girls. And I end up breaking his arm and his collarbone. Yeah, and I got arrested for that and almost got a record, but I was in the Navy. So, you know, I got off on that. But stupid stuff. I remember sitting in that cell being mad at myself. Like, that's stupid. I can't believe I got into a fight. But really, I was defending myself because he swung first. But I can't believe I let it, you know, go that far because of something so petty. Anywhere else, I could have got shot and killed. I could have got, turned into something big. And I was there with, with, with family and friends, but a good thing it didn't escalate too big. But the cops was there, there they seen, actually seen uh, the tail end of it, and they came and arrested both of us. So it was something I got arrested for. I was just like, I remember sitting in there like, what the hell? It's stupid. It's stupid. Like, some of the stuff that we do is crazy, you know, and it's because of this culture, because of this hip-hop lifestyle. And as I said, the black community is not going to change unless the music changes. So unless you get these artists to change their content, which you can, or stop listening to them, or talk against it, be real with yourself on what you really want for your community, because you got to grow up in it. You got to live in it. I moved out. I left it. And I don't like going near it unless it's going to go you know, to visit family. And then I don't like doing that too much because it's always something to go on on the block. You know, it's crazy to be visiting family, you hearing gunshots, and it's like, what the... You know, nothing don't change. And as I said, with all the cops killing us, we can't be killing each other. And the last thing I want to get into is our relationships. We let the hip hop culture control our relationships. This is why black people can't stay together in a relationship, because we let the, the culture, we let the, the whole hip hop culture, everything that goes with it, drive the relationship, you know, trying to be cool. You meet a person being fake, you go to the club, you meet a girl or wherever you meet this girl at, you go there and meet her not being yourself, you know, trying to live up to this culture and be something that you think she wants you to be, trying to be cool, trying to impress her. And it's this culture that you meet, you know, you meet this person bringing this culture with you, thinking this is what she wants or he wants. And it's downhill from there because if you've got friends who like going to the club, then you was going to the club all the time with them before you got into a relationship. Now, when you go to the club and you post videos on Facebook and this and that, about you out with your boys or you out with your girls, it creates a problem. And that's the purpose of Facebook. One of the purposes, it really destroys relationships. I don't know how some of these relationships survive with Facebook, you know, and men, men get jealous. So a girl can't be on Facebook posting a picture looking all sexy and she got like, you know, 80 man likes and comments and stuff like that. What do you think your boyfriend or your girlfriend is going to you know, think about that or feel about that? You know, how are you in a relationship when you're posting videos twerking? So, you know, the culture destroys the black relationship. It's like, as I said, it's one of the things it's designed to do. So while you're in these relationships, trying to be cool, trying to live a hip hop lifestyle, hip hop, be a part of the culture, you creating a separation, you creating a distrust between you and your boyfriend and girlfriend. So now since you gangsta and you about this music and you, you down with that motto, it creates separation. So your white people got shows like, you know, How I Met Your Mother, and they had shows like Full House and all these other white, you know, everybody loves Raymond and all these other shows to help stimulate them as far as what they believe a relationship should be. You know, Mike and Molly, you got all these white couples who staying together. 
we get empire, as I've always point out. We get empire. As I said, I struggled with, you know, what does it mean to be an African-American when I was young? You know, it was TV shows like Family Matters that really woke me up to show me that, you know, damn, we can be positive black people and be successful and live normal. Or what I felt normal was, <clears throat> excuse me, not so much as what white people was doing, but what I thought normal was, like a mom and a dad and going to school and being successful. You know, shows like Family Matters and The Cosby Show, you know, The Cosby Show was kind of like far-fetched to me. You know, these shows showed me that black people can do things. And we don't have shows like that today to show a positive image of black people doing something as far as, you know, loving our women and being together because of this culture. So it's almost like corny now, you know, like being in a, a relationship, black people and loving each other and going all the way. It's almost like that's boring, that's corny. And that's the way this culture has taken it. Like I love seeing when black people get married and we need to see more black people get married and showing that kind of commitment. So now, you know, this is a video I wanted people to definitely come away with the sense of the culture of hip hop. As I said, I put out videos before that really get into uh, more about this. The video I put out, the uh, calculated destruction, the black man and woman, and you know, the end part two of that, you know, uh, it's more, get more into the whole hip hop thing. So I wanted you to really get how this is a weapon, how it could have been something that we could have used as a positive tool to basically, you know, uplift, to stimulate the black community and give us a weapon against their oppression. But instead, they took that weapon and turned it against us. And it has been used against us, you know, since. And, you know, it's still being used against us. And it's something that we got to be real with ourselves and take a step back and say that it's not right. And for the people who sit in these communities, scared to go outside and worried about their children and what may happen, worried about their future, you know, what's going to happen. You got to really, you know, you got to let that demon go. And that's hip hop. You got to be real. You got to say, I'm going to either support this music and be cool with the way the community, you know, is and the way it's going to be because of it. Or take a stand and be uncool and say that this ain't right. It's affecting my child. It's affecting my community. Got the girls twerking, kids twerking, boys fighting and selling drugs and wanting to be nothing but musicians, rappers. Don't want to be anything else. So you're going, we're going to have to step back and say, you know, Jay-Z, cool. You know, I like Fetty Wap. You know, I like these artists. But what they doing, their lyrics, it's not right. And if we can't get something better, then I don't want nothing at all. And we got to realize that these labels control these people and what they put out. They can't put out what they want to put out. I mean, just think about that. I mean, why are you putting out music that's only degrading? I mean, by now, you have to have caught on to, to the fact that we don't have this music. A lot of people just think that we can't put out good hip hop music, positive hip hop music, that it's going to be corny. That we can't put positive hip hop music to a beat. And I think Hobson proved everybody wrong and a lot of the tracks that he put out. It's possible. We can still put out positive hip hop music to uplift the community, still, you know, being able to dance and party to it. So it's it's not that we can't do it. It's just that the labels don't want it. And that's not what they want to put out to the masses of black people. They don't want to put that image out that we can be something more than you know what we are. They don't want to stimulate you. So this was my video. And um, I have, uh, if you didn't subscribe to my new channel, Merkaba Vision, here's a link. Please subscribe and check it out. Also, I have um, a website going up called therealmerkaba.com. What's going to be called themerkaba.com. Not sure yet, but I'm working on it now. Started part three, Saturn, Satan, and God, Nature, Reality. That's going to come out. But also, I've heard a lot of your requests for um, DVDs. A lot of people want DVDs, but can I put the uh, videos on DVDs and put them out? So I'm working on it now on uh, trying to get the videos put on DVDs. I also have a lot of videos that I recorded that I never put out. And um, I have uh, things that I left out of the videos, the final cut that I put on YouTube that I probably put that kind of content and stuff on the DVD. It's probably going to be like, uh, you know, for this 
three disc, four disc DVD with a bunch of stuff on it that I probably put out uh, for on a website. The book is coming. I mean, they put me through so much crap to get this book out, but it's coming. And, you know, it's a lot more coming, a lot more videos. So, you know, subscribe to the new channel. Uh, I will let you guys know when the website is up. And um, I'll see you guys next video.